Joining us for this week's Your Health segment is Dr. Michael Lilly, professor of surgery at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, director of the Maryland Vascular Center, and chief of surgery at the University of Maryland Medical Center Midtown Campus. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Great to be here, Jeff. You are a vascular surgeon. We have a lot of vascular veins and at arteries. Yes, miles we do. Miles and miles. That's right. What is the, what is the quote? Uh, 63,000 miles of piping in the body. Uh, the vascular system is a system of pipes, and um, the heart pumps the blood out through the arteries, the artery pipes, and goes out to all of the vital organs of the body and gathers back together through veins to go back to the heart, be oxygenated, and pumped back out again through the circulation. And a lot of things can, can go wrong. What are the common issues that you see? Well, to, to keep with the pipe analogy, uh, you have the same kind of problems you have with the pipes in your car and in your, in your house. Um, one of the major diseases we deal with uh, at the vascular center is hardening of the arteries or atherosclerosis, which is a condition where deposits form inside the arteries of the body, uh, just like you can get deposits in your pipes at, at home, that narrow the flow and limit the amount of blood that can be delivered to the vital organs, uh, and that affects their function. And we think about that in terms of heart disease or stroke, but the similar process of things basically getting clogged up can happen anywhere. Exactly. Um, hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis can affect arteries anywhere in the body. There are certain arteries that have a propensity to have this problem. The heart arteries, the coronary arteries we call them, uh, are, are a hot spot. Another common place is the carotid arteries of the neck, which are the arteries to the brain, and that's where the association with stroke comes in. Um, the peripheral arteries, when we talk about peripheral artery disease, which is another term for uh, this hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis, that's typically in the extremities or in the neck arteries, the carotid arteries. What, what are the symptoms of that? Well, it depends on where the narrowing is. So uh, individuals with a uh, narrowing in the arteries to the brain uh, sometimes the symptom is a transient neurologic event, weakness in an arm or leg, a change in vision that lasts only a few seconds. Sometimes the first symptom is a stroke. In the extremities, uh, usually it's a functional problem. Uh, the limited blood flow only is apparent with increased activity. So when you walk or jog or have uh, work at, do things at work, um, the legs come up short of uh, perfusion and uh, will have muscular pain. That type of pain resolves relatively quickly as soon as you stop exercising because the demands of the muscle drop quickly. You know, with the, the plumbing analogy, I, w I was thinking that I know more about how to keep the pipes at home clear and running freely than I do about how to do that for the blood vessels in my body. What, what do we need to know? Well, this is one of the main reasons why I like to come on a show like yours, uh, because I think there is a lot of lack of information about some basic things. Um, the simplest things that can be done to keep the pipes flowing uh, are things that, that anyone can do. This is diet, exercise, paying attention to the risk factors for hardening of the arteries, uh, which vary from person to person. The main ones being diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol or lipid problems in the blood, and probably the most important is tobacco. Uh, cigarette smoking is probably the most powerful and potent risk factor for hardening of the arteries, not just in the peripheral arteries, but also in the coronary arteries well, and elsewhere. Curious what the mechanism is there. What, well, that's how does a, it happen? That's a Nobel Prize for you, Jeff. Um, I'll so, work on it. <laughs> <laughs> the association has been known for years, and um, and there's two effects of the of the smoking. One is one that causes the disease to develop more rapidly. And the other is an acute effect of the nicotine to narrow the blood vessels as a, as a chemical. The nicotine's a chemical that does that. If you narrow the blood vessels, uh, blood pressure goes up? It can. And uh, so there can be a feedback between the blood pressure that often is elevated for an unknown reason in many people. Most people who have hypertension have what we call idiopathic hypertension. We doctors don't know why the blood pressure is high. It is. But nicotine will raise the blood pressure further. Uh, let's take a phone call. Baltimore City, this is Alex. Alex, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Good evening, Jeff. Um, Good evening. Great show, as always. Thank you. Um, um, uh, my question to the doctor is, um, do sodium ever leave the heart, and um, how much um, intake of salt do we really need, sodium really needs in our body? Thank you. I'm so glad you asked that question. Well, sodium is a big factor in hypertension. 
and uh, hypertension does have the reputation of being the silent killer. It's an important risk factor for hardening of the arteries, strongly associated with stroke. Um, the amount of sodium that we recommend in the diet is usually less than four grams a day. That's not very much. Um, and uh, uh, however, uh, of course, if you look at the diets that people have uh, and the foods that we buy in the convenience store, there's a lot of sodium in virtually everything that you buy in the store. But the headlines, it's been a while, but within the last year or two, there were headlines maybe downplaying the association between sodium and blood pressure. I mean, it wasn't the, the direct slam dunk cause that we had all been told mm -hmm. to stay off of this stuff. Well, I think um, this is one of the situations where I think it's important for people to have a broad view. Um, there isn't a single silver bullet that deals with this problem of hypertension or atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. It's an impact that happens as, by virtue of interaction of many things. And I think, yeah, the, the message for a long time was salt, salt, salt. message for a long time has been lipids or cholesterol, almost to the exclusive uh, exclusion of other types of risk factors that people should be paying attention to. And I think we doctors need to communicate more broadly about the various different components that can be contributing to this problem. Let's talk to Mary in Baltimore County. Mary, thank you for calling. Go ahead. Um, my question is, suppose you uh, have varicose veins, you know you have bad varicose veins in your legs. And does that also, is that also a sign that you might have bad veins in your neck? And how do you uh, go to a doctor and just say, you know, I'd like to have this looked at? Just like that. Mary, great question. Hey, thank you for calling. And I'll ask it of a doctor right here. I've heard that. The varicose veins are a warning sign that everything may be not right with your arteries, for example. I think it's important to separate the veins and the arteries as different sides of the circulation. And they have different problems. Um, certainly there are individuals who have varicose veins or other types of vein conditions uh, who have hardening of the arteries also. Uh, but generally those two conditions are separate. The risk factors for the two different conditions are different. Uh, we talked about the hardening of the artery risk factors a few minutes ago. Uh, venous conditions more commonly run in families. Uh, sometimes they're associated with hormonal issues um, and, and factors like that that are entirely different from what causes hardening of the arteries. Let's focus for a minute on what you do with the vascular center and, and the types of treatments that are available. Well, I think the most important thing about vascular disease is that this is not some hopeless condition where if you're found to have some chronic venous problem or, or an advanced hardening of the arteries and you're potentially in danger, that there's nothing that can be done. Early detection of the disease enables people to be treated with simple things, diet, exercise, uh, medications, and so on. But even with those with advanced disease, there's treatments today that can be relatively non-invasive and still solve difficult problems that years ago would require complex operations. So we treat the whole spectrum of vascular disease, from veins to arteries, from medical therapy to surgical interventions. The surgeries that you perform, how, how much has that changed over the years from, I'm guessing, more open procedures to less invasive? Well, I don't, I don't want to tell you how long I've been at this. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm one, sure your arteries are in great shape, though. Yes, they yeah. are. <laughs> the, um, when I first trained, everything was open surgery. Uh, there were very few procedures that could be done percutaneously. Uh, today, through my, the skin. Through the skin, right. uh, with a needle, through a, through a small catheter. Today, my practice is probably 70% through the skin, percutaneous with needles and catheters and balloons and things like that. Um, and some of that is the advance of technology. Some of it is more awareness, identifying patients at an earlier stage where we can do simpler types of treatments. Uh, so it's, a, it's been a very gratifying uh, profession to see these kind of changes. Just a couple of seconds. If somebody's concerned about this, they're seeing their primary care doctor, what, what do you ask? How do they know if your arteries are okay? I think the most important thing is to discuss with your primary care doctor your risk factors. Find out what your risk profile is. Uh, individuals' age is probably the most important risk factor. So people less than 60, peripheral artery disease is pretty uncommon, unless you have those risk factors we talked about before. I think that's the best guideline. Very good. Dr. Michael Lilly with the University of Maryland School of Medicine, University of Maryland Medical Center. Thank you. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.